Hello, this is Scott Jens. Welcome to Sandbox Stories. Hello, welcome to this Sandbox Story. This is an interview with Dr. Essence Johnson. Dr. Johnson, thank you for joining Sandbox Stories. Thank you, Scott, for having me today. Uh, I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So let's start by being bold because I think bold matches your energy. Um, at your website, dressencejohnson.com, you share this quote. For the younger generation, I'm example of what they can become. And for the older generation, I'm an example of how far we have come. Can you bring that statement to life by expanding on it for me? Honestly, the reason why I needed that quote was because Dr. Obi Maloki in South Africa, he wanted to feature me on his website. And I really was thinking of like, of course you want something profound, but also something honest. And I think back of just my journey as a doctor from, I remember when I was in those early stages in my 20s, first coming in and everyone is like, are you the doctor? Like, who are you? You know, um, when is the doctor coming in? And then now when I think now, fast forward 10 years later, and when I walk in, it's not, you know, who's the doctor? I get a lot more of like, wow, you are the doctor. And it's just amazing to kind of see that growth just in myself that maturity from, you know, I was the one looking up to so many people and they were paving my way, but to now finally feel at this point in my career that I'm the one people are looking up to, whether they're students or whether they're older individuals that they're finally kind of seeing um, and, and being a part of just a shift, a transform and a change in history. So. That's a lot of where that quote kind of comes from is my own personal journey and just the experience that I am living on seeing just just things change before people's eyes and seeing myself change. And I just remind my colleagues all the time that we are now the generation that's inspiring this next generation. Can you briefly summarize who that doctor from South Africa is? Obi Malopi. So I met him through social media. I have been getting a lot of social media pen pals, whether they are students that are interested or other optometrists. And so he does a lot of work with also my classmate and business partner, Dr. Glover, and they do Africa Media and some other business ventures together. And so just through my newfound social media presence, we connected and he wanted to highlight a lot of female just optometrists and just other females in the eye care industry. And I was so fortunate um, for him to highlight me in his campaign. You know, when Friedman wrote The World is Flat, it must be 15 years ago, I don't think we quite understood how easy it would be in the year 2021 to make friends across the planet as we are. And um, it's just a wonderful experience. Let's talk about your practice. Now you practice at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. I do. Do you have your own clinic there? So yes. So I started practicing um, in the Dallas County Health and Hospital System back in 2014. And at that time, they only had about two, maybe three outpatient clinics, and they were expanding to include more. And my clinic in the Southeast Dallas area, it was, the clinic itself was physically there. They just did not have the optometry oh. department. So I got to be a part of like just building out and carving out um, that specialty in our clinic. And since then we have now grown to include more optometrists in other clinics. And we're also building other clinics in areas of high um, socioeconomic need in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. That's really interesting. Um, as an aside, does anyone else like me from outside Dallas have their interest peaked by the connection to the JFK scenario and, and Parkland Hospital? And is part of that hospital memorialized in any way to reflect that? 
So I tell everyone it, it is part of your onboarding as part of your orientation and your history lesson. So yes, you drive right past the grassy knoll and you know the JFK Museum on your way to Parkland. When we were in the old hospital, there's a bust of John F. Kennedy. When you go in for your orientation, that's exactly the piece and, and fact that they tell you. You know, this is the hospital that JFK was brought to um, on that day. Um, and it's very, it's very much part of our history and culture. It's also, you know, it's something that I take pride in too, to, to be able to be that close to that piece of history as well. Now, for you doing clinical practice, is it a broad scale clinical practice or do you have any special in, uh, specialties or in, interests? So what I love the most about being in community health, um, I also do some correctional health for the Dallas Health mm -hmm. and County Hospital System, is that we are a very much disease-based practice, which is what I did my residency training in. So it's very nice, sometimes a little frustrating to be immersed in disease all the time. So my majority of my population base are patients with diabetes, um, glaucoma, and we do get, of course, there's refractive errors that are in there, but we are a non-contact lens practice, which for me, I love. <laughs> so it is all disease, all the time. A lot of diabetes is where I spend a lot um, of my time educating in the exam room and also throughout the hospital in general. So let's go back to your early life. Uh, you started in California. Your dad was in the army, so you moved around. What did that look like? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of ironic at this point that I have probably been a born again Texan longer than I've been a Californian now. Um, and even when I was in optometry school, if you were to ask people where I'm from, they would say I was from Texas because I went to undergrad here. Um, and now that's where I live and practice. But yes, once upon a time, I was born and raised in Southern California. Um, uh, each one of my siblings, because my dad was in the military, were born of the United States. Both um, born in California, but I was born in Pomona and he was born in Riverside. Um, my sister after that was born in Colorado Springs and then our youngest sister was born in Vienna, Virginia. So that's where I started like my elementary school and things like that. Um, but it, it, people ask all the time, like, do you miss it? You know, would you like to go back? Definitely. Who doesn't like sunshiny weather, a little bit more consistent than living here in Dallas? We get a lot of seasons here in Dallas, sometimes in the same day. Um, that's definitely different from being in um, California, but it is a place that we do like to go, go home to and also call home. So where did mom and dad meet? <laughs> so on the happiest place on earth, as your jacket shows us, um, and even though my dad, he was born in the Philippines because he too is a military family, but he grew up in Los Angeles, California. My mother grew up in a different um, part of Los Angeles, but they met during what we call grad night in California, which is a big event that you have close to graduation. And historically it is held in, at Disneyland in California. So in Anaheim, so they met at Disneyland and kind of our life has been riddled with different Mickey Mouse <laughs> and Disney <laughs> um, insignia <laughs> throughout the way. <laughs> That's awesome. As many of my listeners know, there's uh, so many influential people in eye care that appear as uh, to be first born in their family and you are also one. Now tell me about your siblings. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm the oldest, I have, three siblings. I have two sisters and a brother. Um, my sister right underneath me, she currently serves in our military tradition of our family. So she is in the United States Air Force and she's a major. Um, she was formerly a missileer and she does a lot with like air traffic controls and planes now. Um, my sister right underneath her, she is not formally in the military herself, but my brother-in-law is also in the army. <laughs> so her and my niece, they now live the military life traveling all over the world. So since the pandemic, especially, they were looking for a new assignment that they so graciously um, chose to accept their current assignment again in Germany. 
So that is where she is. And that is where I've been trying to get to to visit. So as soon as like Corona allows, I would love to go visit her um, in Germany. And then my younger brother, he's just a civilian like me. <laughs> and he, but he also has traveled all over the world thanks to um, just my sister's experiences too. And so because when our middle sister was in Montana doing her missileer work, that is where he went to college to the University of Great Falls in Montana. But now he is living in between California and Arizona, test driving and help program autonomous cars. Well, bless and protect your family in the military. And let's talk a little bit about your brother. There was an accident that sort of makes his work in autonomous driving interesting. Can you share that briefly? Yeah, so um, a couple of years back, I want to say um, it may have happened like after our mother had passed away in 2009. My brother was in a car accident when he was driving. I believe he probably was driving in between Arizona and California again, where it was basically a battle between him and a 16 wheeler um, truck. So, fortunately, um, everybody who was involved, they recovered, at least physically. The vehicles did not. But it really kind of put him in a, in a weary position on just being very nervous and hesitant on the road. So kind of like fast forward, he's working for um, this company that they do autonomous cars. But what I didn't realize, the mission of this company is for situations just like this, to kind of take out that unpredictable part of just human air while driving. And so that is why they are working on um, programming and perfecting these vehicles so that it's safer for us to be on the road since most accidents occur because of human error or distraction. I'm glad that he's well, that's really interesting. When you went off to school, your parents told you that you were welcome to come back home anytime. What did a message like that from your parents do for you? Um, it just opens up doors of possibility and opportunities for us. As you guys see, we are Californian by birth and by lifestyle, but that is not where anyone lives anymore. And we have been everywhere within the United States and outside of the country. So it was kind of that, that okay to just go ahead and explore, but also that safety net that if you know where you explored did not pan out to what it needed to be that you could always come back home. Um, it really played a role when it was time for me to go to college. I was kind of all set and ready to go to a school in California. I mean, why not? You, we had different um, governor scholarships and grants. Um, I was very familiar. I was choosing a place just far enough from home, but still you could come back home. And then I got a phone call one day from a school that I never heard of. I never applied to at this point in high school. Um, I really hadn't been out of California except for ironically one trip <laughs> to Orlando um, that me and my best friend helped raise money for in middle school. So Disneyland, Disney World again <laughs> in our life. Um, but I got a phone call from the president of the biology department at Prairie View a and University in Prairie View, Texas. And he had called to say that I had been offered a scholarship and then accepted into their school. And it was quite shocking because I never even applied to school. I, at that time, I didn't even know of the school, didn't have any family to my knowledge that had went there. And my parents were like, go check it out. It worked out great that, um, my best friend, she had relocated to Texas to go live with her aunt. And so we have worked out a deal with her dad. She wanted a car. We were like, we will drive your car to you from California to Texas. And then we'll go and visit Prairie View. So that was kind of like our little spring break yeah. excursion that we go and we visit the campus of Prairie View. And instantly, I mean, I felt very welcomed and in love with the school. Plus it was a full ride scholarship. So that meant oh. zero debt. So it was kind of like, <laughs> and, and that was kind of where my parents really started with the, you know, you can always go come back home, go, 
and see and just see. And how many of us get that opportunity and that support and that unconditional love to just, you know, be pushed into the unknown, so to speak. I didn't know what <laughs> I was even getting up against, but I'm very, very happy that my parents were encouraging to do that. Now, I will say when I would call and say I wanted to come home, they were like, no, you're staying there. <laughs> But it worked out good for us too. So I was able to focus and finish and get to the end. So I am so appreciative that they were able to just instill those parts in us and support us. In and it's a lesson for all families, for those of us who become parents to think about the learning from that story of your parents' openness. Um, Prairie View a and is a historically black college or university and HBCUs have, I think, fortunately been able to get some additional um, understanding and exposure uh, through the course of 2020. How, as a black person, did attending an HBCU shape you and help us understand how important that is to a young person who wants to make their identity, an important part of their life. I, I'm really, really interested in that part of your story. I think that initially going to an HBCU, um, I didn't really have any expectations or I didn't know at first how big of an impact it was going to be and how big of a continuous and lasting impact it will be. Um, so going there it really did just expand my world. And I think sometimes people think like, oh, you're black and you're going to a black school. Like there's not a lot of diversity. Oh, but you're wrong. <laughs> being black and especially being from California and going to Texas was already a whole different type of culture shock, just race aside. Going from California to Texas is night and day. And now it's what I eat, breathe and live and raise my own kids in. Then being on a campus with just so many different types of black, so to speak. We have, you know, people from the south and people from the east coast and people from the north and um, people who went to small schools, people who went to big schools. I think really being on that campus kind of showed that yes, my upbringing in California had its own set of diversity. But the appreciation of like culture and heritage for what it means to be Black and African American really was birthed at an HBCU. There's a lot of things that you learn kind of historically and culturally that you don't get if you're from certain places. I mean, I think the biggest example I had posted about it today on Martin Luther King Day, my, we're listening to the Stevie Wonder song, the happy birthday song. And my husband, he was born and raised in New Orleans. And he was like, we learned this in elementary school. This is the Martin Luther King birthday song. And I'm like, no, this is Stevie Wonder's birthday song. Like we sing it at all the birthdays, you know, everywhere you go, you transition from the traditional. And he's like, no, like we would only sing this on Martin Luther King's birthday. It is about this and the civil rights. I was ready to like call his bluff. I Google it and I'm like, Oh my gosh, not even at an HBCU. Maybe I missed that lesson. Sorry, Prairie View, don't <laughs> take that away from me. But it's just amazing though, just when you're in different geographic areas or demographic areas, the other pieces of history, the other pieces of yourself that you learn. And that was kind of the impact of being at an HBCU had on me that there's just certain things culturally I didn't even know that I didn't know that I'm learning and then to be in this climate where you hear HBCU so much more commonly, like it was just a secret society in some aspects for us or like that more prestigious society. But now it is very important part of news to say, you know, Senator this person or Vice President that person graduated from an HBCU. So it's really a sense of pride to belong to such a great um, network and connected group to not only say, you know, that I'm an HBCU made residency trained community and correctional health optometrist, but to also know the history behind all of that and 
the path that we are walking on, the shoulders that we are standing on, and also the legacy that we're carrying on with. I really take a lot from that. And we are recording on Martin Luther King's birthday and, and the national celebratory holiday of Martin Luther King. And it's a real important uh, point here that in optometry, there is a, what I feel like is a, a new commitment, not necessarily a renewed commitment to the understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And maybe we'll get into that a little more deeply later, but I can't help but think that there are some people who believe that, as you said earlier, if you go to an HBCU, you're uh, sort of closing yourself into other people of, of color. And the, the point I take away so strongly from your perspective is don't, don't let a stereotype like that ride through that, oh, you know, that, that's just one line of thinking, that within the Black community, there are hundreds of different ways that people have been brought up and different experiences. And shouldn't we all better understand that essence? Oh, I think definitely. And that is where a lot of like my current work and passion is in, is helping push forward that diversity, equity, inclusion, and helping define it better for us individually and also as our industry as a whole. I think a lot of times we focus on just, you know, a few small dimensions of diversity. We're always stuck on the color of someone's skin or, you know, if they're male or female, but diversity is in a lot of things. It's in the way that we're practicing, the, the fact that I'm not in private practice, that I'm working in, you know, at the jail and at a hospital. And I didn't know that until a colleague revealed that as an option. Um, it is in the way that we do business. It is in the way that we also recruit students. You know, her, and last year during the pandemic, me and a few colleagues, we started the first nationally recognized and virtual pre-optometry club so that we can, you know, capture all of these different types of Black and African American students. And it's been a very, rewarding experience. And it's just very interesting to, to just meet and learn from so many different types of people and to help each individual in their different path and journey, um, just put their best face, their best self forward and let people, you know, see them for all of who they are inside and out. Wonderful. Um, by whom or how did you get influenced to become an optometrist? So um, it's like a multi-part story. It's definitely one of those things, you know, where you, optometry found me, so to speak. So at first, I wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to be the president of the United States. <laughs> how ironic is that? But my paternal grandmother, she had told me that I would go to hell for lying and that I should not become a lawyer. So these is like a few decades ago. This is what she's telling me. But kind of like you want to talk about hindsight being 2020 or foresight being 2020. I was like, OK, good, good looking out for me, grandmother. <laughs> but I needed another um, option. And so at a career fair, at my school, I believe it was in middle school or high school, I think it was closer to high school, we had the optometrist and we had the admissions officer from the Southern California College of Optometry. Um, that was their name at the time. They came and spoke with us and they brought female admissions officers and optometrists and they were Black and African American. So that really got my attention. On top of when you would go to a room for the lawyer and he had all of these books stacked very high and talking about all these history classes. And then I go to the optometry room, there's no books. <laughs> They're talking about work-life balance and you know science and just what STEM has done for them. That really spoke to me more as where I was in the career. So it worked out very well that they were there to inspire me, that we were in California and there was an optometry school close so I began just researching the career more. At the time, I had a friend. Um, her dad was an optometrist. 
And he was our family optometrist in Moreno Valley growing up, Dr. Wong. And I would ask um, Heather all the time, kind of, you know, would you become an optometrist? And it's one of those things kind of like me and my dad with finance and business that it's like, no, that's what we're around all the time. You want to do something different. But it worked out wonderful that um, I had that connection with him growing up. So then when it was time to go to optometry school and you needed to do clerkships or get internship hours, I had him as my resource. Then in our high school, you had to do a senior project. And so, of course, I did mines on um, optometry and getting to know more. So I would go to the library in Fullerton and I would research strabismus. And then at that time, um, I don't know if it was which one came first, the assignment or my dad's interest, but he got LASIK surgery at um, the optometry school there. And so that was the the main part of my project, researching him, following him, partaking in his pre and post-op recording and all of that. And I think through all of those experiences and those people that have helped me along the way, it really cements in me that, okay, when I go to um, undergrad, I'm going to study biology and I'm going to pursue optometry as a career and, and really make that a reality for myself. Wow. And you say that you used your residency training and still do with the amount of disease you see. Can you outline for listeners who think about a residency, um, particularly the younger listeners, I guess I should say, um, what substantial positive impact that residency had? Um, I think for me, I don't think it was a question on like if I would do a residency after school. I think once like you get to that point in your career and they start talking about that, I was like, okay, when it becomes time, I'm going to definitely apply for a residency. But then you have that piece on, you know, what type of residency It's just yeah. like being a teacher. You get to pick a specialty. So when I started optometry school, I was all about the kids. So yes, I'm going to do pediatric. I'm going to do the pediatric residency. And then like one day in pediatric rotation and a kid ties himself to a chair with my tape measure. And I was like, nope, no kids. <laughs> Let's pick a different one. But even as a student at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, I fell in love with our low vision department um, and just seeing you know, how disease affects people young and old. So I got to still work with some children in there. Um, and seeing it on the side of the therapy side, but also seeing it on the side of the diagnosis side. So when it came time to pick a residency, I looked at ocular disease sites and low vision sites. And then I also took into consideration too, keeping in mind what my parents say that you can always come home and to travel. Like where would be my next location for the next 12 to 13 months? So I looked at the coldest places of Chicago all the way down, you know, to the warmth of the South and Atlanta. And I decided on going to the Omni Eye Center in Atlanta, Georgia, where disease is abundant, where you get to work um, right next to the cataract surgeon. So that was very, a very fast paced, exciting time. I mean, how exciting can it be waking up at four in the morning, but it was a lot of fun being able to, you know, be um, the main person helping people with their care from start to finish. So you are the one working them up and getting them dilated and doing the pre-exam. You get to sit in on the surgery. So it, it was very nice to see someone from start to finish multiple times and then even continuing on with their care the next day. And then we also got the great honor and privilege of being on call. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything prepares you <laughs> for just anything that may come at you than being on call. And on call is exactly what it sounds like. It, I could be hanging out with my friends and here goes that pager. And so you are stopping everything that you're doing to meet someone. And sometimes it's as little as removing a contact lens. And then sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, real serious emergencies. But I was very grateful for that time. Our site did a, a great job of letting you be autonomous and the leader we got to manage. Um, the internships that came through, the interns that would come in, visit us. 
um, really being at the front of working side by side with the ophthalmologist. So you really got um, a good working relationship and understanding of kind of like what happens to your patient when you refer them, getting to know our colleagues in the area when, you know, things just got too tough or too time consuming. We had, you know, the patients in the time, especially being a teaching institution, to literally pick out shards of aluminum from a kid who decided to shoot a can from point blank range or you know dealing dealing with those kind of weird bacterial infections that we only read about in school because a lot of people like to play in the lake in georgia and they would come back with all kinds of weird um <laughs> conditions so anything that i did not get to see in optometry school. I feel like we went through the whole Will's Eye and Mass Eye and Ear and Kansky <laughs> during those 13 months. And for that, I, I have been ready for anything, prepared for anything that comes my way, a lot more patient, um, just that ability to problem solve and think critically. It was very important for me. And I gained that comfort and that courage while doing a residency. When I asked you to describe your greatest strength in life, you used the words, the joy of the Lord. And you said it was particularly important in your journey with your mom. And I like stories uh, about moms and I know yours is an important one. Share it. Yeah, you asked like what, like where do you get your strength? And I know some, it seems cliche, but definitely the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then when I think back, um, even if I just think back to last year and, and everything that has gone on during the pandem pandemic, it's been a tumultuous time for all of us. But I feel like what has given me peace and grounding is uh, um, just my foundation in God. Then when I think of just my journey of being able to get up and leave California, and go to Texas, and then from Texas to go to optometry school, and then to be back here again in Texas, and you ask, how did you make it? I mean, yes, my parents were there to encourage and support, but definitely it is that foundation in Christ that they've instilled in us that has helped. Um, a lot of that goes into especially my journey in optometry school. It a particularly difficult one, I would say, in an unexpected way. And I share this with my students all the time that when I went to optometry school, I was in my 20s and the 20s, there's a lot that goes on. I mean, even when we think of the 20s in history and they say it's the roaring 20s, it's the roaring 20s even in your own <laughs> Your own life. 20s. <laughs> yeah, it is that time of a lot of change and growing and learning and then you throw in trying to become a professional in there. It is already a wild and crazy time. And I remember when I started optometry school, I was very fortunate that my mother was able to fly down to Philadelphia and be a part of all of our beginning activities. So at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, when you start during your orientation, you have a white coat ceremony. Um, it's just a very celebratory time. So I was very happy and fortunate that my mother was able to be there at the start of um, just the start of my profession. When I was an undergrad or when, yeah, when I was in undergrad, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. So I knew at that time that she was sick, but every time, thanks to God, she would come back stronger every single time. Um, then as I got into optometry school, my trips home were a little less frequent because we have a lot going on and a lot of my sites, they weren't always in California. I, I had a condo in Pennsylvania, so I chose a lot on the East coast, um, versus going back home. But about halfway through optometry school, my mother started getting very, very sick to the point that she wasn't bouncing back like that. And I was very fortunate to have some sites that worked around that. And there was even a point in time where I had to leave a site and find a new one in California. So I was very thankful to 
have just friends and family that were loaning me a couch or, you know, uh, a pullout so that I can finish these rotations. And in there, I remember that my brother had graduated from high school and I probably still had another year left of optometry school. And at the time when my brother graduated from high school, my mother was very, very sick and wheelchair bound. So it was very just, we were grateful that she can make it there. But I remember asking her, hey mom, are you going to make it to my optometry school graduation? And she looked at me and she told me, no, I'm not gonna be able to make it. That is probably the first time in my whole life that my mother had ever told me no about anything, mm -hmm. but it definitely um, prepared me for what was to come. But it also helped keep me focused and motivated because if there's anything that she has taught me, it's to keep living. I mean, that has been the story that they've been instilling us from the beginning is to, you know, continue following your dreams. You can always go home. And I think that that coupled with my faith really helped um, prepare for her death ultimately before I graduated from optometry school. And being able to, you know, know that she is still with me and always with me and that, you know, home is kind of where the heart is in these types of situations. So that is definitely where a lot of my joy and strength come, but my motivation between the Lord and my family, they are definitely my, my motivating factors. And now you have a family, you're a mother. Tell us about them. Oh, yes. <laughs> So I am the mother of um, children. So I have a four-year-old daughter, Ramona, and I have a two-year-old son, Randall, or baby Randall, as we call him, until he gets too old for that. And they definitely keep us on our toes. <laughs> I think I'm reminded every day that my daughter is ready for the world to open back up because she would like to go to gymnastics. That is her, right. her thing. So she has been watching YouTube videos and teaching herself cartwheels and other things during this pandemic time. My son at two years old has gotten this fascination with the trumpet. Everything is wow. a trump of all instruments. He's like, I want to play a trumpet. So we were so fortunate that our dear friend, Auntie Johnny, sent him a trumpet in the mail. And I know some people will be like, she sent you a trumpet. But she found a noise-friendly, kid-friendly trumpet. And my son sleeps with it. Wow. So it is just amazing to see life through their eyes, to see so much of myself and my husband of even my siblings, like children have just a way of, you know, showing the best and worst parts of you. <laughs> but also it's just amazing just how, how self-aware they are already at this age and kind of how they're already building their own just hobbies and interests. And so even during this time, I try to do my best to pour into that, like, you want to play the trumpet? Come on, like, let's start playing the trumpet. You want to be a gymnast? Like, come on. So every day I am just amazed by them. And even though I want the time to go real slow, because I feel like they are growing up <laughs> fast already, I just look forward to kind of see those full circle moments to look back on these times where they're telling me I want to play a trumpet. And he is in band playing a trumpet, you know, or my daughter is interested in dance and gymnastics and that is what she is doing. So I just love that my husband reminds them all the time that they are Johnsons and they can do anything. And we just continue to just try to pour into that and support them on anything that they want to do. And we both know baby Randall's going to be baby Randall forever. <laughs> <laughs> Until he tells us not, but honestly, he loves it. He eats it up every time, and he will always be our baby. Ram. He will when he's 50. <laughs> <laughs> Let's shift back to your real strong and I would call powerful commitment to inclusion for people of color and optometry. You're the chief visionary officer for Black Eye Care Perspective, and we had a chance, our listener group had a chance to learn about that organization from Dr. Adam Ramsey. 
And I'd like you to talk about your focus here. Yes, so as the Chief Visionary Officer of Black Eye Care Perspective, um, I do just that. We bring forth, you know, the vision, the life of different initiatives and really put that action and accountability behind it. Um, so on good old social media, that's kind of been my theme this last year. I have met great people and Dr. Ramsey is one of them. Um, I just remember with all that has been going on just in the news and the media as it surrounds Black Lives, also with like HBCUs, we see a lot about, you know, just representation in healthcare on the doctor level. And there was a post or something that came up and I reached out to Dr. Ramsey on social media and he is a very sociable person. He reached right back out very quickly and we were just having a conversation, something that I will honestly admit is kind of new to me to just reach out to people kind of blindly and um, strike up a conversation or to do that networking piece. It was something that it was new to me. And in that conversation, he was like, you know, I'll give you a call. So it went from a few messages, went to a phone call and we were on the phone for at least an hour, if not more. We would have talked all day if we had the time, just not only just talking about the issues, but brainstorming and just coming up with solutions. And he is a rare gem in the sense, is not every day that someone says to you, let's do it. And you're just like, what? Like, don't worry about like, if money's not an object, support's not, like, let's just do it. And I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. So what birthed from that conversation was our impact HBCU initiative. So we were talking about, you know, what can we do to increase representation in our field? A lot of people ask us all the time too, like, well, why just black? It's not a just type of thing, but we needed a starting point. And surprise, you guys, we are black optometrists. So that is where we started. How can we get more people that look like us? And then also, how can we be of more influence and be more visible to those people that look like us? So that is where the, the start began, not as something to be exclusive, but to begin including and to begin putting focus on an area oftentimes is not the priority of the majority. So we made it our priority, which has caused a lot of buzz and has started a, a very nice domino effect too, as well. So from our Impact HBCU initiative, we grew into having that pre-optometry club because we need a place to nurture and, and foster these relationships with these students that we are recruiting. And back in August, when we had our first pre-optometry club meeting, what started with one student grew to five students, now we're nearing 50 students in our club that we are mentoring, that we are advising, that we are connecting them with resources, some that have always been available, some that are just now becoming available because of this, this renewed focus on an area that you know some people may have wanted to make strides in, but they weren't making lasting advancements in. And then just that area that it has not been on many people's priority list, it is slowly climbing to the top. So it has been a, a very rewarding journey and we are just getting started. So we are very, very excited with that. Well, I applaud you on the work you're doing. I applaud you on the 13% initiative. I gave Adam and you my commitment that Sandbox Stories will always meet the 13% commitment. And um, we're here as a community to support what you're doing. We want the profession to look like you. We want the profession to have the expertise and the ability to affect others like you. And whatever we can do, all of us, myself in specific, uh, please let us know. Uh, as we get toward a couple final pearls, why don't you give me some, what I'll call quick hitter replies to each of these. I've got three things to hit you with. 
What do you say about waiting for versus creating opportunities? I think that you should create opportunities. Maybe that wasn't the 20 something year old me, but the 30 something year old me says that you only get what you have the courage to ask for or what you go out to do. So I'm all for create those opportunities that you want. How about words have power? Yes. <laughs> I um, it, it goes even back to just, you know, my foundation in Christ that words have the ability to create. They have the ability to inspire. They also have the ability to destroy. Um, I am a firm believer, you know, that the power of life and death is in your tongue. So we work on a lot of that, even in our pre-optometry club is just the psychological part, changing that narrative, changing that story, speaking, you know, life over yourself, speaking things into existence. That's a lot of even where vision boarding comes in, like being able to visualize and conceptualize those things that you want to bring into your life and also detract from your life. And I think within that, if you don't mind me jumping on that, for optometrists, the idea that the words that they use have power and thinking and visualizing what they mean uh, to the recipient and being very careful with them is incredibly important. So what about the power of manifesting and visual visualization? Um, I think a lot of that comes even with my title of chief visionary officer for Black Eye Care Perspective. Um, many people say, you know, what is a chief visionary officer? How does one become that? And quite honestly, um, when I got my title, we, we researched and we looked it up. There are a list of chief everything in the world and being a chief visionary officer is one of them. There's even chief people officers. Um, but even more importantly, the, the vision part of it is about hearing these words or ideas that people have and then being able to breathe life into what you see and you would like to happen. That's wonderful. I'm gonna give you the last opportunity. If there was a bit of advice you could give to an optometrist listening today, from your perspective as a human, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, I think for my colleagues especially, I think the ultimate advice is we hold that responsibility of being that source of information and inspiration to the next generation. Um, especially the colleagues closer to age for me, I remind ourselves all the time that we are that next generation. When we say that we want things done or how come things haven't been differently, we are those people that now have that responsibility to push things forward. And I think many of us are doing our best to try not to always do what just has historically been done for history's sake. And that we really are starting to pave these new ways and build and create these new opportunities for our future generation to advance and excel in our profession. So just please colleagues, just stay open, stay available. Um, remember when these new students come to you that we too were once those students. And so they're just looking for someone to glean some information, someone to shadow, someone to write a letter of recommendation. So to be open and available to them. Essence, wow. You're a great example of success in family and in optometry. And I can't thank you enough for your incredible insights. Thank you so much for sharing time with us today. Thank you, Scott, for having me. And to the audience, as always, thank you for listening and attending. And until my next Sandbox story, be great at all you do.